The dinosaurs. It seems like it's been years since I talked about those prolific and wonderful beasts. Ever since us humans started to uncover and better understand their fossilized remains buried in the rocks beneath our feet, we have longed to bring the extinct reptiles back to life, myself definitely included. I'm sure it's a dream every child once had, to see and touch a tyrannosaur or a sauropod. There is practically an entire thriving industry devoted to recreating dinosaurs, in illustrations, models, computer-generated graphics, and so much more, in our books, in our video games, in our documentaries, and of course, in our movies. They might not always be accurate, but nonetheless, time and time again, the drive for us humans to satisfy our desire of seeing these once great creatures alive is very strong. Over the past decade, one rather eccentric paleontologist has offered dino fans everywhere a possible way to achieve this dream of meeting a living, breathing dinosaur in the flesh. But is he actually right? And even if he is, should we do it? Hello there guys, welcome back to another installment of Trade the Explainer. Today, I plan to discuss Jack Horner's Chickenosaurus project and in doing so, discuss the brave new world of genetic engineering that I believe we should begin to take seriously in the ensuing decades. It's a project, as someone involved personally in the field of genetics myself, I am, and currently working in a genetics lab, am very much interested in. And funny thing is, that the lab facility I worked at actually received funding from the Chickenosaurus project. I'm not entirely sure if I contributed myself, but somehow I'm actually tied up in this, which is as crazy as that sounds. I digress. Well, we must first ask a question. What is the Chickenosaurus project? Where did it come from? And why is it being done exactly? The last of the non-avian dinosaurs, that is any dinosaur species that wasn't those lucky birds, became extinct around 66 million years ago. All that is left of them are bones that have turned to rock. They have all died. 30 years ago, the novel and later film Jurassic Park introduced the idea of bringing these dinosaurs back to life through the ever-increasingly advancing field of genetics. The book's author, Michael Crichton, by using cursory knowledge of the field, concluded it was possible that dinosaurs could be resurrected using this advanced technology through ancient DNA, DNA collected from inside partially fossilized remains that have survived the eons of time. In his novel, scientists used this prehistoric DNA to clone animals like Tyrannosaurus rex and Velociraptor. As I think a lot of us know, it doesn't turn out well for them in the end. Though creating a stir, the actual science behind this methodology is rather flawed. Though such methods might be possible for resurrecting a mammoth, perhaps, DNA simply doesn't survive as long as Crichton suggests. DNA disintegrates over time, even in the best conditions, and has an age limit at best in the hundreds of thousands of years not millions or even tens of millions, as would be required for a dinosaur's DNA. Unfortunately, or maybe perhaps fortunately, it is incredibly unlikely, if not impossible, to resurrect dinosaurs in the way used in Jurassic Park. But bringing back dinosaurs via tinkering with DNA did appear to interest one scientist in particular. Enter paleontologist Jack Horner. Now Jack is an interesting dude to say the least. I could probably make an entire video about him and the opinions of the scientific community towards him. I've heard him referred to as the quote-unquote Tiger King of paleontology by an old biologist colleague of mine. Initially making quite a big name for himself in paleontology, digging up countless valuable fossil specimens like dinosaur eggs and T-Rexes, and serving as Crichton's primary inspiration for the Jurassic Park character of Dr. Alan Grant, Jack Horner was, and still is, a notable figure in the study of dinosaurs. But by the late 2000s, Jack had decided to pursue a very different type of project, one that would help him achieve his lifelong dream. In 2009, he published his book, How to Build a Dinosaur, Extinction Doesn't Have to Be Forever. In the book, Horner attempted to lay out a plan he had formulated to bring them back. How would it be done? Birds are dinosaurs, specifically Manoraptoria and Theropods, closely related to dinosaurs like Velociraptor and the like. Their ancestors used to have tails, three clawed digits on their wings, and teeth in their mouths, all of which the descendants of these, through evolution by natural selection, have lost over time. But these characteristics have not been completely lost. Anyone who has simply dissected a chicken wing you can buy from the supermarket can easily see this. Buried beneath fluffy feathers are the remnants of dinosaur claws. If one looks at the embryonic development of a bird chick in the egg, they can see that the bird wing is in fact three digits fused together. 
Sometimes primitive dinosaur-like teeth can appear within the beaks of some birds during embryonic development. The DNA of birds, and in fact all organisms alive today, is filled with genes passed down from their prehistoric ancestors that have been silenced through evolution. Within the DNA of humans, for instance, we have genes that code for our coccyx, or tailbone, which is in truth the evolutionary remnant of a tail. Certain special humans are actually born with visible external quote-unquote tails. Others, like celebrity Mark Wahlberg, are born with more than two nipples. Some dolphins have been born with hind flippers, the evolutionary remnant of a second pair of limbs, which betray the descent from furry little mammals that used to live on land. All whales actually create these hind limbs during development in the womb, but lose them before they are born. These are all atavisms. An atavism is an evolutionary throwback, an instance where traits once held by one's ancestors that have been over time silenced or hidden by evolution are turned on by some kind of rare mutation. They happen all the time. Horses with extra toes, vestigial limbs and whales or limbless reptiles like snakes, tails and humans, and yes, dinosaurian teeth and birds. After learning of atavisms from paleontologist Hans Larsen of Montreal, this was where Jack Horner formulated his plan to turn birds back into dinosaurs. His plan was to reactivate, or turn on, as many of these silenced dinosaurian genes in a modern bird, such as a chicken, as possible, through genetic modification, like the teeth, wing claws, and long tails of these birds' ancestors. Turn a chicken back into something like what its Jurassic ancestor would have looked like over 150 million years ago, a chickenosaurus or chickensaurus. Perhaps a good analogy would be like trying to turn your pug back into something resembling an undomesticated wolf, or a whale back into something like Ambulocetus, or humans back into apes, or give a blind mole, whose eyes are like this, its eyesight back after evolution deprived it of such a luxury. That was the idea, anyhow. Horner used his pre-existing fame to popularize and fund such a project. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, have been donated for the project. A fair amount was even given by director of Star Wars The Phantom Menace himself, George Lucas. Again, it's like poetry, so sort if of they rhyme. Horner has used this funding in several genetics laboratories across the country and has contacted many research organizations and universities for help, mine included. In 2014, Horner stated the project might be completed in the next four to ten years. Oh boy, it's 2020, I can't wait for my chicken dinosaurs. Oh. So that was a great TED talk and all, but does Jack Horner's project have any actual merit? Is it even possible to create a chickenosaurus? Well, it's complicated, but the answer is probably no. The vast majority of the scientific community I have interviewed has criticized the project. Horner's 2009 book, which was supposed to pave the way for his project, has been largely criticized by scientists in the field of genetics and biology, who claimed it lacked a lot of the substance and background necessary to the chickenosaurus project. Critics claim Horner has been vague, to say the least, about his methods, and even simple justification for doing such a thing in the first place, and we will get to that in a bit. One major point of criticism is that, despite the fact that the project's general claim is to create a gorgeous, breathtaking dinosaur, at best the resulting creature, if successful, will be no such thing. British zoologist Darren Niche said, I don't think the genetic meddling with chickens will result in a beautiful, inspirational animal at all similar to Mesozoic Mineraptorians. Geneticist Dr. David Hall stated with the project, you just end up with a weird shadow of a dinosaur, a fake organism. Harvard geneticist Matthew Harris has been a very vocal critic of the project, asking, what are you going to learn if you could do it? Technically, you're going to make a messed up chicken. It's not a dinosaur. It's never going to be a dinosaur. It's just going to be a really awful monstrosity. Woof. Point being, even if Jack Horner is effective in turning on all the atavisms, Odds are, it won't look that good, or even much like a velociraptor, or what the ancestors of the chicken must have looked like in the Jurassic. Evolution has silenced those genes for a reason, and it won't be especially healthy for the animal if we were to turn them back on. The whole basis of the project as bringing back a dinosaur is flawed to say the least. A chicken is a dinosaur. Again, it's like trying to reverse evolution a human back into a monkey. It just isn't going to end up looking that good. It probably would act like a regular chicken, and aside from some minor characteristics, also would look like one. I emailed Jack Horner myself, and the project has run into some problems. We are a long ways from hatching an animal, he told me a few months ago. 
The tail of the chicken appears to have been a particular problem in turning back on, because its development doesn't appear to be atavistic, meaning that in order to get a tail on a bird, Horner and his team would have to utilize transgenetic or CRISPR techniques. The team would no longer be turning on genes, but introducing wholly new ones taken from other organisms and placing them in the chicken genome, effectively creating a new organism. Like if I took genes from a mouse and decided to put them in a whale, or um taking genes from a cat and putting them in a human uh, to create cat girls or cat boys. The project has gotten a little hairy to say the least and at best is conceivably still several years away, if not a decade. It is the majority opinion of many scientists that it won't really end up the way Jack Horner expects. But what I want to ask with the rest of this video is, is it even ethical to create a chicken source? Should we even do it? Us humans are going to start asking ourselves these questions within the next hundred years, as genetics becomes an ever increasingly more relevant aspect of our society. And yes, I know I'm saying this as a geneticist. Genetic modification is a controversial topic, especially in the United States, and like seemingly everything in the US, it is highly polarized. Many people fear the simple word GMO, or genetically modified organism, and treat it as something along the lines of a Frankenstein's monster. Science gone wrong, humans playing God. I'm actually in the middle ground. Heck, I've actually helped make genetically modified organisms. I am of the opinion that GMOs are not the monsters people claim, but I do not think humans should start playing God with them either. People should not blindly fear all GMOs. We know that GMOs can actually be of great use and benefit to humanity, especially as we are starting to deal with serious problems such as climate change and overpopulation. GMO food, for instance, has been demonstrated to be no more dangerous than non-GMO food. In fact, almost all the food we consume has been genetically modified in some way. Since the dawn of civilization, humans have been selectively breeding mutant strains in their crops together to create Frankenstein food. How do you think we got corn from Teosinte, or pugs from wolves, or bananas from this monstrosity? Modern genetic engineering techniques is simply fast-tracking what humans have been doing for thousands of years and the technologies have given humanity net benefits. Before genetic engineering, insulin for diabetics had to be painstakingly extracted from pig pancreas glands from slaughterhouses. It was difficult, expensive, and the insulin wasn't even human, so it could sometimes cause allergic reactions in some people. 56 million animals per year were needed to meet the US demand of 5 million people at that time. With GMOs, human insulin genes have been inserted into bacteria, which produce actual human insulin faster, easier, and cheaper, and even safer for the now over 30 million Americans who rely on insulin to survive. There are many other transgenetic organisms that could conceivably make life for us humans much easier. We've created cold-resistant strawberries, saltwater-resistant crops, which can survive in areas where rising sea levels have disturbed yields, and golden rice, which allows for a more efficient and effective source of vitamin A in East Asia, where deficiencies in this vitamin are common and kill thousands of children a year, and so on. Not all GMOs are bad, and I think we should acknowledge this. People should maybe be cautious, but they probably shouldn't be 100% against them, and it shouldn't be a zero-sum game. Some can be good, and some could be bad. You said these dinosaurs will be patented. InGen will own its dinosaurs, and no one else can legally make them. Michael Crichton in Jurassic Park. Wrapped up in this conversation, however, is the fact this emerging scientific field is highly unregulated. 30 years ago, there was virtually no regulation on the field of genetics. Greedy corporations could manipulate the system for profit. And it's not necessarily the science that is to blame, but the corporate system. In 1994, geneticist Mary Claire King and her lab worked hard to identify and name gene BRCA1. The gene has been linked to breast and ovarian cancer in humans, and now that the gene was found, it could potentially save lives and prevent cancers. However, the company Myriad Genetics cloned the gene not too long after and patented it. They sent King a cease and desist letter stating she could no longer work on the gene she identified. Yes, as crazy as it sounds, you used to be able to patent genes, genes that can be found naturally in virtually all humans, and legally prevent scientists other than your own from working on them. You used to be patented 4,300 times. Prior to 2013, thousands of your genes belonged to corporations. It was only in 2013 that the Supreme Court finally outlawed human gene patents. 
But this left loopholes for things like cDNA and GMOs, which still to this day can be patented and owned by corporations. This is notably why it's so nuts when you find out insulin was cheaper for consumers when we extracted it manually from cows and pigs, rather than today with genetic engineering. Today, most universities could make insulin treatments in-house if they wanted to, and it should practically be free. However, certain companies have patented those insulin-producing bacteria and have driven the price up far beyond what it actually costs to produce, to make, money. To this day, the laws are naive and oversimplified and easily manipulated. There are so many loopholes and vaguenesses in them that definitely need to be examined more critically and maybe revised in our government. A company could get away with something as ridiculous as genetically modified cat girls, probably. Currently, it seems that if we created cat girls, they would exist under the regulation of the FDA, which says this. Jack Horner could maybe patent the chicken source if he wanted to. I legit don't know if anyone knows for sure if he can do that. Not even the Supreme Court, because nobody has even thought of any of this. For the novelty. The justifications given by Horner for even creating the chicken source have been criticized to say the least. Horner has stated the project could benefit genetic research of human diseases and give insight into bird evolution. And this may be true. However, I think all pretense of this being a solely scientific research venture stops when you raise an adult specimen of the chicken saurus with all those genetic changes in its DNA. As somebody who has worked in genetic research, I know that such a thing is simply not necessary. Often working on embryos tells us the same information and causes much less pain for the animal. Whenever you genetically modify an organism, it carries with it unintended effects to the rest of the animal's anatomy, behavior, and health. We know this, and we shouldn't ignore it. And the chicken saurus, being a far more extreme case than I am familiar with, would most likely not have a happy life if we created it. The only time I've ever seen adult specimens of genetically altered research animals raised and been modified significantly were for scientific figures and papers. This, for instance, was worked on by a colleague of a colleague and is a mouse with genetically altered limbs. It essentially has snake DNA. This animal in the figure was one of those rare instances when you raise the altered lab animal to full maturity. You can see that the majority of the body is completely normal and healthy, but the limbs are truncated and are little nubs as a result of CRISPR techniques, which have placed a certain enhancer sequence from a snake into the mouse. Such a thing is very rare, and again, some would debate if raising this animal beyond the embryo was ethical as it is. This has been done mainly to demonstrate the effects of the research of this lab, and this research has benefited our understanding of the DNA of these creatures, and could help us humans in the future. This individual mouse, though, probably didn't have the best life, all things considered, unable to really move its limbs. The chicken saurus would probably be a far more extreme case than this example. Horner has said he plans to use the chicken saurus as a powerful education tool to teach people about evolution and disprove creationism. This again is rather flawed. A bit of the credibility of the whole project on that front disappeared when it was decided to add transgenetic elements, genes taken from other animals, to the Chickenosaurus, effectively making it a genetic chimera, and not some instance of reversed evolution or atavism. The whole education tool seems unnecessary. Microphotographs and pictures of natural atavisms, many of them in embryos, seem good enough evidence for evolution on their own. Again, they are cheaper and the animal doesn't suffer as severely as the Chickenosaurus might. If this was being done for solely research purposes, there would be no real need to grow an animal to full maturity. His other goal was possibly eating it, which, um, okay, I guess. Nah, the primary purpose of the Chickenosaurus project, based off interviews and lectures, is that of a novelty animal. Horner has repeatedly talked about how cool it would be to have a pet dinosaur, and he has emphasized that the Chickenosaurus project is essentially him trying to seize this dream. Kids would love it, and it's cool. Many, many people have criticized the project for being unethical on this front. Should we create animals for our entertainment? Tell me, she says. What is the Biosyn Corporation? I've never heard of it. It's a small company. We make what are called consumer biologicals. We specialize in recreational and sport organisms. For example, we engineer new kinds of trout and other game fish. Or making new kinds of dogs, smaller pets for apartment dwellers, that sort of thing. Exactly the sort of thing Ian hated. Michael Crichton, The Lost World. The Jurassic Park novels were very much a commentary on this subject. It seems Crichton himself would be firmly against the Chickenosaurus, as it would go against the very themes and messages presented in his novels. 
Crichton clearly drives home that the concept of a living biological attraction, life created by humans explicitly for our amusement, in his view is very unethical and immoral, and this seems to be a large driving force behind the project. Many modern critics have echoed this sentiment. To some people, there is just something off, unethical about creating novelty animals, weird living things for fun. Horner has responded to these critics with this. We've got all sorts of genetically modified animals, already just from breeding. We could make a dino chicken, and we could make a glow-in-the-dark unicorn. Basically, we can make anything we want, I think, once we understand the genes. And my question is, why would anyone care if they don't care about a chihuahua? His argument has essentially been, if it's okay for us to create dogs, it should be okay for me. And that's the thing. We know now that we constantly have bred and still breed lethal, harmful, and unhealthy traits into our animals all the time. Basically just for fun, or because it looks cute. Dogs with facial deformities that cause them difficulty breathing and early death. Dogs with spinal problems and stubby legs that cause arthritis. Cat breeds that will always have one-fourth of their litters die before they're even born. We even once selectively bred humans, short or tall humans together, for our amusement. We did such things in the past, and still do today. And the question is, was such a thing even ethical in the first place? Should we have created the genetic monstrosity that is the pug? And should we keep on breeding them? We know that these animals are not as healthy as they could be, and we have made it this way. These are all legitimate ethical questions that should be asked to us as a species. There are some people who are completely okay with continuing to breed pugs or chickens that are so fat they can't even stand up. Hey, it's already been done, why stop now? And then there are some that do not find such practices ethical. Scientists have already made pet glow-in-the-dark fish, and could conceivably make all kinds of strange creatures through genetic engineering. The chair dogs, living furniture from the Dune series, for example, or miniature pet elephants that could fit in your arms, are not so much science fiction ideas anymore. It's possible with enough time and resources, but should we do it is the real question. Is it ethical to knowingly create an animal that will live a life in pain and suffering? Science doesn't tell us the answer, and it is something we must consider ourselves. Like any field, there are fundamental disagreements over such things. Just because you can do an experiment doesn't mean that you should do an experiment. Perhaps I am biased as someone who has literally helped make GMOs, but I am of the opinion modern scientists shouldn't just do the whole play God thing with genetics, and do things just because we can. Choices need to be carefully thought out and considered, including the health of the animals we produce. Just like with any scientific field, there needs to be a level of ethics. An archaeologist can't just dig up some guy's grave for the heck of it, or at least not anymore. And unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, it means things like human Z's or dino's chickens maybe shouldn't be made, however cool they might be. In conclusion, at the moment, I'd say the chicken source is a no for me. After my research, in my opinion, I think the project is unrealistic, and at its basis is unnecessary, and maybe unethical. And in the end, if successful, the result would ultimately be pointless. Odds are, all we'd end up with is a sickly, weird breed of chicken. I worry that considerations or concerns like the ones stated above are not being asked. Now, is the chicken project the terrifying start of a new scientific age of genetic monstrosities and Frankenstein monsters created for our amusement? Well, probably not. But it illustrates to us we must begin to start asking very real and relevant questions related to GMOs and bioethics. I feel like laws and people's attitudes need to update a little bit and consider the value and also a bit of the caution of gene modification in our not-so-distant future. And with that, thank you so much for watching. I'd like to thank Jack Horner for helping me out with this video and answering my questions. If you're watching, no hard feelings, man. I really wanted to support the project, but I'm not sure I can at the moment. Perhaps you could change my mind in the end. Check out this project for yourself, and maybe even donate it if you support it. Link's in the description. I'd like to thank Arturo Garcia, who made the new entry you guys might have seen at the beginning of the video. He's going to talk to you guys for a quick second. Hey guys, Arturo Garcia here. Thank you so much to Trey for featuring my art and animation in his video. If you liked what you saw, you should follow my art Instagram account at artgarciadrawandpaint, where I post a lot of paleo art, fan art, commissions, art exercises, and of course, animation. Link in the description of the video. I also have a Facebook and DeviantArt page where you can follow me as well. It was a lot of fun working with Trey to create the new logo and intro. 
I've really enjoyed his videos for a while, and you should subscribe to keep up to date with his content. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you around. Alrighty, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And my singing! Say your brother's got a Jones, and he looks like skin and bones. He says he can kick it when he wants to.